9.01 a.m., April 19th, 1995, a crystal clear morning in Oklahoma City. 9.02, in a blink, the sky dark with a plume of deep black smoke. There was a tremendous explosion, a massive explosion at the federal building in the center of the city, the AP Murrah building. Uh, we have a large column of smoke to be south of this address. Are you going to check on that? That's affirmative. We just heard some loud explosions. The whole front of the uh, building was gone, all forced to the roof. The Oklahoma City bombing stands as the deadliest domestic terror attack in U.S. history. 168 lives lost, 19 of them children. Investigators have identified a vehicle that was used in connection with yesterday's attack on the federal building here in Oklahoma City. Further investigation has determined that two white males were associated with this vehicle. As a result, arrest warrants will be sought for these two males. I remind everyone that John Doe number two remains at large. He should be considered armed and extremely dangerous. I must point out to you, however, that their exact identities are not presently known. Thus, the arrest warrants that I am discussing will be for two men, each identified only as John Doe. There is a strong likelihood that other persons are involved in this tragedy as well. The first man is of medium build. He is further described as being approximately 5'10 to 5'11" weighing approximately 180 to 185 pounds with a light brown crew cut and he is right-handed. The second man is also medium build. He's further described as 5 feet 9 inches to 5 feet 10 inches tall, weighing approximately 175 to 80 pounds with brown hair and a tattoo visible on his left arm below his t-shirt sleeve. He's possibly a smoker. Composite sketches of these two men have been prepared. <clears throat> Copies are on the way for everyone. People should not attempt to take any action against John Doe number two or anyone else involved in this matter. Both of these men should be considered armed and extremely dangerous. Citizens should not, therefore, attempt to take any action against these men. But we continue to urge anyone with information to call 1-800-905-1514. This information has been communicated to law enforcement at all levels, domestic and international. That I welcome this kind of examination. We tortured some folks. The CIA is fundamental to America's national security. There is a war going on, the battlefields in the mind, and the prize is the soul. I don't believe anything the government tells me. But I want to say one thing to the American people. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. I never told anybody to lie, not a single time, never. Hi. I am Irv Kopi, host of Movie Theater. <laughs> Joe Brandon, I yeah. agree. Wait a minute, wait, I want a woman. I want a woman. I want a woman. All right, Cincinnati, it is time for this town to get down. This is the Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick. This is John Potash, author of Drugs as Weapons Against Us. You're listening to the Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick. Hello, America and the world. Welcome to the Midnight Rider News Show. I am S.T. Patrick, your friendly neighborhood host, traipsing and traversing through the trials and travails that have so tempestuously and untruthfully, God, are they untruthful. They've been blasted into your eyes, ears, and minds by the state-sponsored talking heads, court historians, and textbook conglomerates that control information today. Now, tonight we have episode 164, Richard Booth on the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing. The guest tonight is researcher Richard Booth. 
First, however, let's clean this castle, shall we? Now, Garrison Issue 9 is still available, and I say that because Richard Booth contributed the cover story on Oklahoma City and the FBI failures. Amazing work, and you're going to hear part of that tonight. But if you're looking for more information on what you hear tonight, that is the place to get it. And you can go to MidnightRiderNews.com for all the information. Also, in the last episode, we did announce the radio station, STP Radio. It is live, alive, and doing well. And we should have both the Android and iPhone apps available by the next time we meet on the show. But then again, that's really up to Google and Apple and not as much up to me. They have been submitted for approval. Um, until then, you can listen at WSTPRadio.com. That's WSTP Radio. Com. Now, if you do like the 1960s through the 1990s, if you like those eras of music, this is the place for you. We also offer classic country and Americana overnight, so there is some variety. And the schedules are on the website as well, so you can see the specific programs that do air. Again, that's WSTPRadio.com. We'll be right back with Richard Booth. This is nuclear physicist, ufologist, Stanton Friedman, author of Top Secret Magic, that Operation Majestic 12, and the government cover-up. For more on the most significant UFO cases of the 20th and 21st century, and how the U.S. government tried to cover them up, listen to episode 38 of the Midnight Rider News Show. There's a lot to be told. Ah, the great Stanton Friedman. I loved having him on the show. Uh, I used to listen to him all the time on the Art Bell program, Coast to Coast, when both Stanton and Art were alive. So just hearing that brings back some really good memories. Thank you very much, Stan. Uh, so tonight I want to cover something first before we get into the interview with Richard Booth. Uh, every so often you will hear sort of loud noises in the background of the show. Because this is Auburn, Indiana, um, that's just going to happen. Now, let me do explain. Let me explain for a second, please. Um, Auburn, Indiana was the home of the Auburn, Cord, and Dusselberg cars back in the, I think it was 20s and 30s. And it seems to be the divine right of every male in the town, and a lot of females actually, to have a loud classic car. Um, it gets to the point where you see so many of them that, that you even forget that they're loud classic cars. However, when I'm doing the show, I can't stop hearing them because they are everywhere. So if you're wondering why sometimes the cars seem abnormally loud, it's because they are. Uh, Auburn Cord Dusselberg, Auburn, Indiana. That's where your esteemed host is from right now. Um, however, we're going to get to Richard Booth, a great researcher and Garrison's resident expert on Oklahoma City. I don't know anyone who has done more research and poured through more documents on Oklahoma than Richard has. So, Richard, thank you for being on the show. Hey, ST. Thanks for having me. Oh, no problem at all. No problem. Uh, you know, when we wanted to talk about this story, when we wanted to finally delve into Oklahoma City on the show, we knew we had to have you on because... You are the resident expert of Garrison on this story, and um, you were the first guy that I thought of. So let's really go into it, because the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing is a complicated emotional story. I, I think made more so because of the FBI's investigative failures and their constantly changing narratives, narratives that still change even today. But it dawned on me this morning that I meet professional people all the time who are too young to remember 9-11 in 2001. And so therefore, they may not have even been born in April 95. It, it does, yes, make me feel older. But because this time period, this was my college years. This is Southeast Missouri State University, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And I remember these events. I remember sitting in the dorm room watching these things take place or actually watching the aftermath of all these tragedies from 93 to 95 just a horrific time period and so why don't we do a brief refresher course for everyone out there young and old so that we can all be taken back to 1995 once again so i would ask you from a bare facts perspective even from a mainstream perspective uh, please take us back to oklahoma city in april of 1995 absolutely and you know what you're you're right it feels like it was just yesterday for me as well and uh, you know, I, I feel a little old now, I guess, but uh, to, to go back um, 
and go over this. Uh, I was essentially a, a junior in high school uh, when the bombing happened. And uh, when the bombing uh, happened, well, firstly, I should say, I guess, what, what exactly happened here. So on April 19th, 1995, um, there was a terrorist bombing in Oklahoma City. And it was a massive bombing, it destroyed about three quarters of uh, the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, a uh, massive loss of life. And um, essentially, the official story, uh, what that says is that on April 18th, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, an army buddy of his, uh, built about a 7,000 pound ammonium nitrate bomb in Kansas uh, at a lake called Geary Lake. And that on the following day, uh, in the early morning hours, McVeigh drove this bomb in a rental rider truck from Kansas to Oklahoma City, uh, drove through downtown Oklahoma City, uh, where the FBI investigation shows about at least 20 people saw McVeigh in that truck and saw him with a passenger, and that he, uh, he parked this bomb in front of the Murrah building, exited the vehicle, and just minutes later, uh, the bomb detonated. And this caused a staggering uh, loss of life. It was a great shock to everyone in Oklahoma. Uh, it being like, I guess you call it like the heartland and no one ever expected like a war zone type event to happen uh, right there. And so um, well, the school I went to, uh, we had cable television in all of our classrooms from a grant from a local cable company. Um, now we normally did not make use of these TVs. Kids would like, they'd want to put on things like MTV, things like that. So they were normally really never used. But on this day, a teacher popped his head in the class and told you know, our teacher to turn on the TV and uh, put it on uh, one of the news channels. And there's live coverage right there showing, you know, the building and the billowing smoke. And it was just really a horrific shock. And uh, about 168 people were killed uh, in this bombing, tragically, uh, including a daycare. Um, just unimaginable horror, if you could imagine. Um, so, you know, first, right away, everybody was wanting to know what happened, who did this, you know? And the initial, um, the initial suspicion, of course, were people thinking that it was Middle Eastern terrorists that did it. Uh, but very quickly, the investigation actually came up with a couple of suspects. And the way this worked is that the FBI investigators located an axle from the bomb truck uh, at the, the blast scene, and they traced that truck to a Ryder rental truck place in Kansas called Elliott's Body Shop. And by going to Elliott's Body Shop, they were able to determine that this was a truck rented there on April 17th, and they interviewed uh, it's a small place, you know, it had three or four employees there. And they interviewed these three employees who worked there regarding the people who picked the truck up. And in doing that, they produced two sketches of uh, two suspects, which were known as John Doe 1 and John Doe 2. Now, those sketches were put out within about a day of the bombing on, uh, I believe it was on April 20th, uh, possibly the 21st, so I think it was the 20th. Um, they put out these these sketches. So when I saw these sketches in the paper, probably like a lot of people, um, we you know our thought is who are these people? We couldn't could not believe it, you know. And so there was a nationwide manhunt underway for these two people. And um, as far as Timothy McVeigh goes, he fled the scene of uh, the bombing. He had he'd stashed a mercury marquee in an alley by the federal building, which uh, when he left the truck, he went to that marquee and he left Oklahoma City. Uh, he was speeding on the highway. Uh, he had no license plate on his vehicle, which caused a state trooper to pull him over about an hour after the bombing. And so he was pulled over for a minor traffic violation. However, uh, he had a concealed weapon on him. He had a 45 caliber Glock pistol concealed in a shoulder holster, and the arresting officer, uh, Trooper Charlie Hanger, noticed this bulge on his jacket and uh, essentially 
um, took him into custody for this firearms violation for carrying a concealed weapon. So within an hour and a half of the bombing, McVeigh was in custody, uh, but no one knowing uh, that he was the primary suspect. So while this investigation is ongoing, he is essentially in jail awaiting arraignment for the gun charge. And meanwhile, back in Kansas, the FBI is investigating. They have these sketches they're designed based on the body shop witnesses. And they take these sketches and they start interviewing people in the area. And one of the first places they went to uh, was uh, a hotel uh, or a motel that is called the Dreamland Motel. The FBI agent on the case, Agent, agent uh, Scott Crabtree, actually uh, decided to go and visit all of the various motels along the interstate there. And the first one he visited actually was the Dreamland Motel. And he showed this sketch, uh, John Doe 1 and then John Doe 2, to uh, the motel operator. And she thought it looked a great deal like one of, uh, one of her guests, which happened to be Timothy McVeigh. Uh, he had been checked in there for several days prior to the bombing. And so she identified that sketch as being Timothy McVeigh. Uh, separately from that, there was a gun shop uh, at Fort Riley in Texas called uh, Pat's Gun and Pawn. And uh, FBI and Army CID investigators showed him the John Doe 1 and 2 sketch. And this surprised me a bit, um, but he, he remembered um, one of his customers uh, from about a year prior to the bombing uh, is, is having a look like this John Doe 1 sketch. And I thought his memory was, it was amazing. But at any rate, he says, this looks like a lot like a guy who's bought several firearms from me. And he goes and he pulls this guy's paperwork, and it, it's the Tim McVeigh's paperwork from having purchased uh, several firearms from him. So through those two witnesses, the uh, Dreamland Motel manager and Pat Livingston with Pat's Gun and Pawn, the FBI came into all the information they needed to identify uh, McVeigh. And using that, they were able to look cr at crime databases and so forth and see that he was actually being held in, in jail um, for this firearms charge. And so they go and they get him uh, within just two days, two days, two, three days of the bombing, and they've got McVeigh in custody. And, and that essentially is, is how the bombing played out on uh, April, the week of April 19th, 1995. And that essentially as well as the official story. Well, that's the mainstream story of how they got Timothy McVeigh, but I'm curious, what's the mainstream story behind how they also found Terry Nichols? Well, as far as Terry Nichols goes, um, that's interesting. So Nichols himself uh, was not the person who's in the bomb truck with McVeigh, who was seen with uh, McVeigh in Oklahoma City, because Nichols stayed back in Kansas. So Nichols is in Kansas on the 19th, and he actually um, subscribed to cable television the day of the bombing, obviously because he wants to watch the coverage. Um, so he uh, is at home. He sees the coverage and he hears his name mentioned on the radio. And this is because when McVeigh checked into the Dreamland Motel, he listed as his home address as well as uh, his driver's license listed his home address as James Nichols in Decker, Michigan. Uh, McVeigh was kind of a, a nomad. He traveled state to state on the gun show circuit and he didn't have a permanent address. So he used James Nichols, a friend of his at, uh, address as his home address. And the FBI found that through their investigation and it was leaked and mentioned then in news reports that, um, that the FBI was looking for um, James and Terry Nichols as suspects. So Terry Nichols actually went and turned himself in to uh, local authorities in, in uh, Kansas when he had heard his name mentioned uh, as part of the investigation. Okay, so we've established now that there's a sketch of John Doe number one and a John Doe number two. And don't take my word for it. Don't take Richard's word for it. In the opening montage of the show this evening, you heard both Weldon Kennedy and Janet Reno talk about John Doe number two. Weldon Kennedy described him in detail. So they are there. 
Um, now, what happens to John Doe 2 is part of the story we're going to tell tonight. But before we do, you touched on you really being piqued by the story, your interest being piqued by the story. Mm-hmm. But at what point did you really decide to go into the interviews, go into the documents, and really become a researcher on this story? Right. So, yeah, you're correct. I, I did have this interest very early on, but I didn't move beyond uh, more than like a an overt interest into active research until around 2012, 2013. Um, what happened then is uh, Roger Charles came out with a book called Oklahoma City, What the Investigation Missed and Why It Still Matters. And at that point in time, I was already just reading anything that came out about it, you know, reading things in the newspaper. Um, And when I read his book, that really brought up a lot of things that I, you know, hadn't been aware of before. And what I did is I actually um, reached out to Wendy Painting, uh, who at that time was also a researcher on this case and is still a preeminent expert. I reached out to her via email and uh, was introduced uh, to, through, through her to Roger Charles. So around um, shortly after Roger's book was published in 2012 is when I started networking and met uh, uh, Wendy Painting, Roger Charles, Jesse Trinidou, and my intensive research, what I, well, what I started doing is I wanted to write a book. And this was around 2013, 2014 that I started writing a manuscript on it. And so it's background research uh, for that book, I uh, was scouring databases, you know, that have news reports and archiving everything that I came across just to do my background uh, research. And I got to a point after about six months that I had just this massive archive. And then through talking to Wendy and Roger, uh, they provided me with a great deal of documents on the case. As Wendy had visited the UT Austin archive and uh, Roger Charles had briefly been an investigator for the defense team. He, uh, previous to that, worked for ABC News 2020, uh, was a journalist, and so he provided me with a great deal of documents as well. So as these documents and these news reports start uh, piling up and I've got this archive, I thought, you know, I really would love for something like this to have been available to me when I started research on this. So I think I should put it online. And that's kind of, that's what I did. I put everything available online in the hopes that it would be there for future students of the case. And so all this kind of came to a head in about, I'd say the time between 2016 and 2019 is when I was doing that intensive research and networking and putting the research materials online. Great. Well, let's get right down to uh, John Doe number two. And and I think that many may have forgotten completely about him, and which is, I would have to say, great news for the FBI, who would later claim that for all intents and purposes, there was no John Doe number two. Now, we've ran the sketch in at least two articles in Garrison. We'll certainly run it again. But the John Doe number two story has really been a saga. And some have said it was Jose Padilla. Others have said they thought it was Hussein al Hussani. Uh, others have said, well, we'll go into that later. But rather than go into any identity first, I, th- I think it's important that we prove existence again, especially when combating the conflicting stories of the FBI. Mm-hmm. So can we prove, Richard, that John Doe number two was a real figure? And if so, why does the confusion still exist? Absolutely. So essentially um, what that's about is when the FBI started their investigation at the body shop, they interviewed um, four people there, uh, the owner, Eldon Elliott, uh, Vicki Beamer, um, Todd, or Tom Kessinger, and a mechanic named Fernando Ramos. And they interviewed these people about, okay, who, who's he, who was here in the office when this truck was rented? And it was a small place. They didn't have a lot of people coming through, you know, maybe one or two a day. And so they were all able to pinpoint exactly when the truck was rented. And the interesting thing here is they provided such a detailed description because it was only a couple of days after the rental that they were interviewed. You know, the rental happened on the 17th and they're being interviewed on late on the 19th and early on the 20th. And so uh, if we're to take the FBI's word, all these witnesses were absolutely accurate about their recollections of John Doe 2, all of this, or that is to say John Doe number one. 
but then they were all completely wrong about John Doe too, which just doesn't really make sense. But the bottom line is all of these people um, are absolutely certain that uh, when the, the bomb truck was rented, Timothy McVeigh was in that truck or in that office with another person, with this John Doe 2 person. Now, separately from that, you have another whole roster of witnesses in downtown Oklahoma City. As when Timothy McVeigh delivered the bomb on the 19th, he was spotted and he actually interacted with, you know, a guy in a, who works in a convenience store. McVeigh stops in and he buys uh, two Cokes and a pack of cigarettes. Meanwhile, he doesn't even smoke. So what, you know, what are those things for? So this happened and that's one of the witnesses. And then he also stopped at a tire shop uh, asking about the, the bunch of one way streets downtown in Oklahoma City. And he's asking uh, for directions to a certain area. And so you have this uh, whole roster of witnesses who saw McVeigh in the Ryder truck with a passenger. And it's largely believed or assumed, I guess, in some cases, that the passenger who is with him was this John Doe, too, as he's not otherwise been identified. And now part of the documents that I obtained on this case that I was most interested in were the FBI 302 reports from these witnesses, as well as grand jury testimony that they gave in 97 and 98. Uh, and then also uh, there were transcripts from the federal and state trial uh, for people who may have testified to having seen this person. So basically you, you have very solid identification of McVeigh being with another person to the point that on April 27th, when the government has its first hearing on this case, it has a preliminary hearing, which was overseen by Merrick Garland, and his primary witness is FBI agent John Hursley. And at this preliminary hearing, the government is giving it details to show that it has a reasonable basis for uh, uh, prosecuting McVeigh. And this FBI agent is on the stand talking about all the witnesses they have that saw McVeigh uh, delivering the bomb and in downtown Oklahoma City. And lo and behold, every one of those witnesses saw him in the Ryder truck with another person. And that's right there in the, the grant or in the uh, preliminary hearing transcripts. But yet by the time we get to the federal trials, this guy has entirely disappeared. Um, and in my case, actually, I began to think that uh, so, you know, I was I was being lied to, I guess you could say, about this case when in June of 1995, the FBI up and announced that John Doe 2 does not exist simply he doesn't he doesn't even exist and at that point i thought well there's something weird going on here because i'd already read so much about the suspect that i knew for sure he existed well then how gosh this is mind-boggling richard so then how does the fbi go from point a to point b how does how does the fbi get from weldon kennedy holding up the sketch and describing the physical nature of John Doe number two and Janet Reno, the attorney general warning of John Doe number two. How do we get from that point to the point where they're denying the existence of John Doe number two? I mean, 24 witnesses. If I went into court with 24 witnesses for almost anything, I think I would do pretty well. So how does the FBI get from point A to point B here? Right. That's a very good question. So one of the strategies they employed is when McVeigh went to trial, um, none of these witnesses who were touted at the preliminary hearing were ever called as witnesses. Now, the prosecution doesn't call them. Right. So they're not calling any of these witnesses. So they don't. Most of them, that is, their testimony is not introduced. And then the defense uh, they don't have a reason really to call them because, of course, these witnesses could identify the defendant, McVeigh, as having been there. So the defense has an interest in not calling them. So they essentially excluded from the federal trial uh, John Doe number two entirely. Now, separate from that, the way that it, it worked with the media and the American public is uh, around June of 1995, the FBI came forward with this mistaken identity theory where they basically said that, okay, all the witnesses at uh, Elliot's body shop, they were simply mistaken. Uh, McVeigh rented the truck by himself and 
these other two individuals who came in and rented a rider truck on the 18th were confused by the witnesses for one another and that they were remembering the two guys from the 18th instead of uh, what they saw on the 17th. Now, the problem with that, with that theory is that one of these witnesses, Eldon Elliott, the owner of the body shop, was not at work on April 18th. And so if he's not at work, then he doesn't have anybody that he could potentially confuse uh, because he has no memory of those other two people. Well, right. Yes. If he wasn't at work to see anyone, how could he be confused about who he saw? So Mm. that's correct. Now, if John Doe number two, if the story from the FBI changes and uh, completely and the FBI does a 180, I guess the question we then have to ask is why? Why was the John Doe number two story troublesome for the FBI? Mm. So there is one reason I think that we can possibly reasonably reasonably conclude that that this is one reason why they did it. And what I think that comes down to is risk aversion. Um, The the Department of Justice had learned from a 1988 sedition trial where they brought about a dozen people to trial for sedition um, and they failed and then all of them were acquitted. And so what I think happened here is the FBI uh, wanted to narrow the scope of the conspiracy down to just McVeigh, and they wanted to avoid any sort of risk by having to talk about this other person that they can't identify uh, as it would weaken their case. And so there's one reason there is wanting to narrow the conspiracy. But obviously it's more than that, and we can, while we can only speculate there, I tend to think that it, there's a good possibility that John Doe 2 may have been some form of provocateur or informant, and if that got out, it would uh, it would leave some sort of liability for the FBI. Of course, people would ask, well, if you had this informant or what have you, uh, how come you didn't stop it from happening? So I think that his identity, and this is what I can tell by looking at the documents, is that his identity was a burden for the FBI. And that in and of itself, I think it it speaks volumes. Well, now we're on to something, correct? Because if John Doe number two were an agent provocateur or were an informant, uh, well, actually, why don't we extrapolate this out? So let's assume he is. Let's assume he's an agent provocateur or an informant. Then we have to ask an informant on what? An agent provocateur for what program? Obviously, he's following McVeigh. So then we extrapolate that out to, well, what program has been ongoing that would have followed McVeigh? And... So John Doe number two becomes a non-factor probably because of that. However, Terry Nichols, when he goes to trial, he absolutely wants to use John Doe number two as part of his defense. And I would say wisely, uh, that becomes a problem. Absolutely right. He did. And that is um, in one, one area where we do have some testimony from witnesses uh, who were called by the defense. And in fact, I believe that's the reason that Terry Nichols did not receive the death penalty, whereas, you know, McVeigh was tried and convicted and got the death penalty. Terry Nichols, um, the jury failed to uh, failed to get give him the death penalty. And a large uh, reason or large part there uh, for that is because they felt that the government failed in some manner to prove their case entirely because they're thinking well, who is this other guy who's seen with McVeigh at the scene of the crime and when the truck's being picked up and you haven't identified him? And so they, there was enough doubt in the jurors' minds um, that it, that did prevent him from getting the death penalty. Now, Timothy McVeigh was put to death, but Terry Nichols is still at the Supermax in Aurora, Colorado, correct? Um, he's in, uh, I believe he's still in, super, in the Supermax prison there. I could be wrong about that, but I, I believe he still is. I'm unsure as to what the security is like at the Supermax regarding mail, but if someone wanted to write Terry Nichols, would they even be able to? Yes. Yes, they can. I know that there are some people who have corresponded with them from, there were some victims, in fact, who uh, were corresponding with them to try to find out more. Um, And um, 
Um, I've seen online uh, this gentleman who corresponds with infamous figures and one of them being Terry Nichols. So um, you can correspond with them, but I've, I've never done that myself, although I've strongly considered it. Um, but I just feel like um, his, his communications are probably um, closely monitored and I just don't know how much I might be able to uh, you know, discern from communications with him. Right. And like you said, I'm not sure he could really say anything of value because I'm sure the mail, especially his mail, is being read word for word and probably copied at some point. And so I'm not sure how much value we would even gain from that. But if John Doe number two were an agent provocateur, it could have been for the programs PatCon and VAPCon. And yes, I know that not every acronym is meant to be read as a word, but just to make things easier tonight, uh, what are PatCon and VAPCon? Yeah, so essentially uh, PatCon is FBI shorthand for Patriot Conspiracy, and VAPCon uh, was shorthand for Violence Against Abortion Clinic Providers. And these were two uh, FBI major case undercover operations um, designed to infiltrate the radical right in the 1990s. And according to one of their uh, PATCON uh, undercover guys, their, their role or jo their job was to actually incite them to violence. And what happened here is after the 1988 sedition trial in which these legitimate terrorists, I would just call them, that's, that's what they are. They were white supremacist terrorists were found not guilty. The FBI found itself in a position where they knew that this ideology was going to create another generation of violent extremists. They wanted to get ahead of it. And so they created this, this PATCON program for the explicit purpose of building inroads within the extremist communities in order to prevent another group like the order from emerging. And in doing so, they actually went way beyond uh, what any law enforcement agency should do. It, it very much looks similar to what you see with the Gretchen Whit Whitmer kidnapping case, where you've got, where you have these informants who are pushing the plot along, suggesting the target, going so far as to foment the plot. Um, and, and we believe myself and other researchers, that there is a tie-in between PatCon and the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, as well as other uh, notorious uh, events that occurred in the 90s. Yes, and this is actually a good time to bring those up. So in August of 1992, we have Randy Weaver and Ruby Ridge. In April of 93, we have Waco. In April of 95, we have Oklahoma City. So we have these three momentous events within four years, and these law enforcement agencies, the FBI, the ATF, are intimately involved in all three in some way, shape, or form, even if it's just for investigation, or we'll put quotation marks around just for investigation. But you have agents like Larry Potts. These agents were at all three events. Well, yes, Larry Potts was involved, and you do see people in the FBI uh, who there is overlap between these programs, for example, with, with Waco, with, with the Waco massacre, um, Bob Ricks, who is the the uh, special agent in charge of the Oklahoma City field office, he was the PR uh, or spokesperson during the Waco massacre. So you, you would see him on television. And so you've got some similar figures there. You've got Bob Ricks, you've got um, Larry Potts. Um, in some cases, you have Danny Colson. And so, there, yes, you do have figures who were involved in each of those events uh, working the same cases. If they were targeting Oklahoma in 1995, obviously watching McVeigh, what was McVeigh involved in that would have been worth the time and effort of, of either PatCon or VAPCon? Um, at that time, um, there was a violent uh, separatist community called Elohim City. This, this was in Oklahoma um, on the border there and uh, in Muldrow, Oklahoma. And so essentially it's a separatist compound of Christian identity extremists. And it was uh, uh, from a long line of things like this. If you go back throughout the 80s, there were other compounds. There was one called the Covenant Sword and Arm of the Lord, which was raided on April 19, 1985. It's 10 years before. Well, some of the people from that group, the CSA group, ended up living in Elohim City. 
and you have this uh, place as a nexus for white supremacists, uh, extremists, and terrorists. You've got people who are robbing a string of banks. You have people who were found guilty later of murder who are there. Um, and according to FBI documents regarding informants uh, at Elohim City, Timothy McVeigh had visited there. And this is not just one informant who says this, but multiple uh, informants of both the FBI and the ATF. And so there was a definite belief among some in law enforcement that people at, uh, from Elohim City who were either living there or passing through had connections uh, to the bombing conspiracy. And uh, in fact, the ATF uh, out of the Tulsa uh, field office, they, they had an informant there and they believed uh, that the bombing conspiracy had been plotted out of there and that there were people involved uh, who were hiding out there after the bombing. And that, that's what they listed as a reason for sending one of their informants back there. So that was definitely a, a target by both law enforcement and uh, media. There was early coverage that took Elohim City into account, and that is discussed in some of the, the early coverage of the case. Well, why don't we move into the investigation now, the FBI investigation? And I think we must bring into the story at this time a man named Danny Coulson. Now, he's an FBI agent, not from Oklahoma City, but from Dallas. And Coulson in 1994 would tell the AP that there were still unanswered questions about the case and that a lot of things happened within the investigation that were what he called inappropriate. So, Richard, who is Danny Coulson and what was his overall impact on this case at large? Yeah, so Danny Coulson occupied a position where he was the he was in charge of the crime scene in Oklahoma City. And based on his resume, he really actually should have been the he should have been the top the top dog on the case, but that didn't happen, which I'm not quite sure the reason for that, but um so he's in charge of the crime scene and Danny Coulson uh, is a person who has extensive or had extensive experience with this white separatist community. He would participated in taking down uh, Bob Matthews of the order in 1983. Uh, he had participated in the siege at the Covenant Sword and Arm of the Lord in 1985. In fact, he led the negotiations for that standoff in which there was no loss of life uh, at all. And so he was in a, a key position, oh, and also he was the founder of the FBI's hostage rescue team. So he was a person who definitely uh, could have easily been the lead on the Oklahoma City bombing case, but for whatever reason, uh, the FBI instead uh, put the case in the hands of a, a gentleman by the name of Weldon Kennedy for a short time before handing it over to a uh, Danny Deffenbaugh. Uh, but separate from that, when we want to talk and look at Danny Coulson, you're correct about his quote. He did say that, which I found to be incredibly interesting. And he also uh, spoke to the BBC in 2007 when they did a special on the bombing. And he went on uh, the BBC and talked about the 20 witnesses, uh, 20 plus witnesses who saw McVeigh with another person in Oklahoma City. And so he definitely is a person who believes and understands and he, he knows that there were others involved in this. And he has uh, been outspoken about it in some cases. And there is just an incredible story about how Coulson finds out about the bombing. Now, of course, again, it depends on which story you believe. But uh, there's one story, and you know the one I'm talking about, that deserves to be told. How does Coulson find out about the bombing? Now, this is a really interesting story. Um, as, yeah, Danny Coulson, he writes about this in his memoir, which was called No Heroes. And if we go by the story in Danny Coulson's memoir, he says that on the morning of the bombing, uh, he received a phone call from John O'Neill at the FBI out of their counterterrorism center, which I'm sure a lot of listeners are familiar with John O'Neill and uh, his connection to the investigation of bin Laden. But so he supposedly received a cell phone call from John O'Neill telling him about the bombing and that he needs to get to Oklahoma City. And so he writes in his memoir that he's 
traveled to Oklahoma City, uh, said he, he claims that there were no flights out of Texas, and so he had to uh, drive his car through a rainstorm uh, straight from from Dallas to Oklahoma City, where he says he arrived, you know, late, and he just gives this whole story about how he arrived there. But uh, when you listen to Danny Colson promoting his book, No Heroes, on book TV, the story changes ever so slightly. And on that uh, appearance, he claims that he heard about the bombing on television. And separately from that, we actually have obtained Danny Colson's travel records. Uh, and they show that Danny Colson was actually in Oklahoma City and checked into uh, his hotel nine hours before the bombing. And we have his hotel receipt that shows he checked in uh, sometime shortly after midnight on April 19th and that he was in Oklahoma City, which, of course, caused you to question why is he lying about how he heard about the bombing and why was he there in advance? Well, yes, it would have absolutely caused me to question that. And for all the keen researchers out there, this is really going to start reminding you of 9-11. But there are also stories about foreknowledge regarding the ATF being told not to come to work that day. Absolutely right. And this caused quite a, uh, uh, well, it caused a lot of uh, friction with the, the, the bombing victims because uh, they knew one another and they'd heard these stories and they'd heard firsthand from some of the victims uh, that essentially the ATF was not at work that day. And what happened there, uh, at least where that, I guess, story originates is that um, one of the, one of these folks who lived in Oklahoma city, his, his wife worked in the credit union and the Murr building. And when he heard about the bombing, he traveled uh, down to the, the bomb site. He went there uh, with his supervisor from work, a gentleman named Tony Brazier. Um, so they both went to the the side of the Murrah building because, of course, this guy wants to find his wife. And he flags down an agent of the ATF, a guy with an ATF jacket on. And now the thing is, this guy, he, he knows people in the ATF, some of the local agents. He and his wife were friendly with them and knew some of them. And so he flags this unfamiliar agent down. And he's talking about, you know, I need to find my wife. I need to find my wife, you know. And he said, can, can you get some of the local ATF guys? They know me. And, and uh, you know, he thinks you know, they'll be able to help fill him in and, and help him find his wife. He's just desperate, you know, to find her. And this agent, uh, he said, was unfamiliar to him. And he said that he got on his two-way radio and was talk, trying to reach somebody and ultimately came back to tell him that why well, no one's available right now, but you know, uh, they weren't at work this morning. Uh, they had a, they got a page uh, telling them, you know, not to come in. And this gentleman was interviewed by a local news station, uh, channel four in Oklahoma city, as well as his boss, Tony Brazier, who said, you know, th this is indeed, uh, what this agent said. He said, plain as day, those are the words out of his mouth that the agents were not there that day. And, uh, it's disturbing to say the least. And the ATF has come forward with multiple different excuses uh, before they seem to have coordinated their, their stories. And they told the bombing victims that, Oh, well they weren't there cause they were on a, uh, there was a golf tournament happening out of town or, Oh uh, yeah, there were 20 people there at work that day. And um, that was checked out. That was found to be wrong. So it was the golf tournament thing. Um, and then uh, the actually Lester Martz, I think his name was, uh, out of the uh, Texas uh, ATF office, said that, oh, a great deal of them were out on an all-night surveillance operation, which that got my attention. I found that to be really interesting, as I believe that might be closer to the truth. Uh, one of, uh, as a story I heard from Roger Charles, uh, he told me that he had a source who was in law enforcement, and this source was part of the investigation. And he says that on the morning of April 19th, um, he was eating breakfast with some other law enforcement agents at a Waffle House in Oklahoma City, and that they had been out on an all-night surveillance operation, and that, in fact, they were involved in a sting operation. They were going to capture um, terrorists in the act and bust them, in the, dropping a bomb off in the middle of the night, 
And he says that while they were at breakfast that morning, after having called off the uh, the sting operation because the truck never showed, they heard the bomb go off. They actually heard it. And that, I think, right there is the reason why the ATF had some, uh, well, they weren't there at work that day, and also why I think Danny Colson is being deceptive about how he heard about the bombing, because I believe he was involved in this, in a task force with the ATF, and they had some sort of sting operation ongoing, and uh, it was completely botched. And of course, you know, you're not supposed to have real explosives in, in something like that, but obviously the people who did this bombing either outsmarted them or something happened that it caused it to completely fail. And obviously they have to, uh, to cover that up. Richard, anytime there's a major bombing in the U.S., uh, a few months after, there, there, there seeps out, as Jim Pinkerton likes to say, information likes to be free, but there seeps out some information about trial runs or practice runs or war gaming. Um, do we see any of that in the Oklahoma City story? There are, actually. And this is one of the little-known stories, but uh, an excellent story was published by uh, the Rocky Mountain News by Kevin Flynn, a great reporter. Uh, he wrote a book about the order called The Silent Brotherhood. I recommend people read that. But uh, Kevin Flynn was following the bombing story and publishing a number of good uh, pieces on the case. And one of the stories he wrote was about a practice run at the Murrah building that happened on April 18th, the day before the bombing. And he interviewed a gentleman by the name of Guy Rubsman who was a security guard at the Murrah Federal Building. And he said that sometime in the late afternoon, around four, a rider rental truck pulled up to the Murrah Building and he observed uh, two to three guys jump out of the front seat of this rider truck in a hurry. He said these guys were in a hurry. So they park a truck, they get out really fast, and he thought that was unusual, but then on the other hand, they had deliveries there sometimes, so not entirely unusual for a truck to, to come up. But he thought it unusual enough to go check on that again. He went around uh, 10, 15 minutes later to check, and the truck's gone. But he, of course, after the bombing, views that incident as very suspicious, and I tend to agree with that, and uh, believe I believe that this was uh, people, uh, McVeigh himself included, among uh, the other people he's working with, doing some form of practice run. Hmm, that's interesting. There, it's not like the FBI was without problems itself, internal problems. Was there not an agent that tried to take a surveillance tape and sell it to Dateline NBC? Absolutely, and this is just a staggering story that I can't believe uh, the, this footage has not leaked. It's just blown me away that it hasn't. But what happened here is uh, in October of 1995, you see some news reports. And in these news reports, they say that there exists surveillance footage of the bombing. And it actually says on this Associated Press report that run in every major daily in the country that there is surveillance footage of the bombing that shows two people in the rider truck. And so it, it's got a law enforcement source quoted in the article saying you can see two people in the truck. And that story just kind of came and went. But, of course, it certainly got my attention. Now, around uh, within two days of that Associated Press report, that was like, I want to say, October 28th. On October 30th of 1995, there is an FBI report, uh, 302 report, that comes out as a result of someone at Dateline NBC contacting the FBI. And this person contacted the FBI to say that an FBI agent had approached them at Dateline to attempt to sell them for $1 million surveillance footage of the bombing. And not only that, this footage was screened for Dateline NBC at the home of an Orange County sheriff. And all this is documented in this FBI 302 report. And so, uh, in that report uh, and in a subsequent news story about this, uh, it, do it documents how this uh, tape that was screened was a compilation tape showing multiple camera angles, including up to the point when the truck was delivered and two people step out of that truck. 
and it would show uh, the detonation of the bomb. And ultimately, because this uh, person called the FBI to report the attempted sale, that generated an FBI investigation, of course, and it generated an Office of Professional Responsibility investigation, which is like the FBI's version of internal affairs. Um, and what's interesting, though, with this is that we don't know the results of this. Like the name of the agent who tried to sell the tape is today unknown. Uh, we only have some minor details about him that he worked out of the Los Angeles field office um, and that he had been in the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, there's enough identifying information. I believe a good investigative journalist could probably discern who he was. And that would be a person I think that myself and a lot of other people would be interested in talking to. Um, but yeah, there definitely was surveillance footage of the bombing. Someone did try to sell it, and I'm just shocked uh, that it hasn't leaked to this day. And there are multiple failures from the FBI, and you've written about them in Garrison. Um, I think you've done two or three articles so far, and there's more to come. So for everyone out there, I just want to put in a little plug for the magazine. If you want to read Richard's work, uh, it's just fantastic, and I think you'll like it. But let's move to the CIA, because there's been a lot of discussion, actually, about the CIA in Oklahoma City recently. Uh, what angles are you pursuing regarding the agency and the Oklahoma City bombing? Okay, so that's a great question. And this comes in part from uh, when I put together this archive and I put it online for, for anyone to access. If anyone's interested, then go to um, libertarianinstitute.org slash OKC and access all of the documents on there. And what I found is that someone on Twitter had been going to my archive and was pulling documents out and analyzing them. And one of the things that, that he really likes to do is to look at CIA connections to people who were involved in the bombing. And it, this is something that also caused me to look a little bit closer at it. And ultimately what you have here and what um, this person is shout out to 12 ball, who is the, the guy who's been doing this. But um, what we have found is that the, the person who funded the Oklahoma city bombing, a gun dealer named Roger Moore, uh, a, a robbery, uh, he had a, a robbery where a bunch of guns were stolen from him. And it's a long story, but anyway, it's believed that Roger Moore uh, uh, participated in this robbery and he set it up so that McVeigh could rob him and then use the proceeds to fund the bombing. Well, this guy, Roger Moore, who ended up being a primary prosecution witness uh, in the case against McVeigh, uh, who should have been a co-defendant, uh, he actually had uh, longstanding ties to the CIA at the time of the bombing. Uh, he was involved with the Iran-Contra affair. Uh, he was involved with building and selling speedboats to the CIA in the 70s and 80s, and in fact became a millionaire uh, from doing that. And he also sold arms to CIA-connected organizations, two of those being um, a group called Civilian Material Assistance, uh, which your audience may be familiar with that group. Um, he was selling them firearms and also to uh, Cuban exile groups in Florida. So you have this direct intelligence connection to one of the key figures in the case, and, and that's just where it begins. So th there are other intelligence connections that are just incredibly disturbing, and it's something I have begun looking more at as a result of these new students on the case uh, digging up things in the archive and pointing things out. And it's created a renewed interest, which I'm very uh, excited about and I'm glad to see. And that is one of the things we're, we're all as a group collectively pursuing right now. Oh, I absolutely think that is a worthy pursuit. Now, you said that you think that Roger Moore should have been on trial as well. Is there anyone else other than Roger Moore that you think should have stood trial? Yes, yes. Um, people who should have been co-defendants there were, uh, well, I should better, a better way to frame it is to say that those people who were involved in the bombing conspiracy included Timothy McVeigh, Terry Nichols, Michael Fortier, Roger Moore, and of course, the unknown uh, John Doe number two. Um, right now, those are the only folks that I'm comfortable saying definitely should have been co defendants. There are other people who are certainly of interest. Uh, one of those people, 
is an individual named Andreas Strassmeyer, who uh, earlier I had mentioned Elohim City. He was like their chief of security and also widely believed to have been some form of counterintelligence asset uh, who is actually working there to collect intelligence. That's a person I would view as a person of interest, not necessarily the point to saying he should be a co-defendant, but it certainly looks, a detective would certainly view him in that manner as being a suspect. And not that Strassmeyer was showing any kind of grave concern, but he quickly, after Oklahoma City, he quickly hightails it out of the U.S. via CIA pilot Dave Holloway, correct? Exactly right. This is another area where you come up with all these intelligence connections. It's crazy. If you look at Andy Strassmeyer, he comes from a wealthy family in Germany, a nice uh, upper middle class upbringing. He's bilingual. Uh, he speaks uh, fluent English, German, and Hebrew, which I like to point that out because if, if this gentleman is serving as the head of security at a neo-Nazi compound, um, it does not, to me, sound credible to say that he was some form of neo-Nazi when actually he's a uh, more of a liberal uh, uh, middle cent cent uh, centrist or liberal type figure. And like I said, he speaks Hebrew. He, he went on a kibbutz in Israel several times, and he served in counterintelligence in the German army. So it strains credibility to say that he was actually this neo-Nazi when really, when you look at it, it looks more like he was some form of intelligence asset there at Elohim City pretending to be a Nazi. And you mentioned Dave Holloway, uh, that is correct. When he when he fled the country, he was essentially exfiltrated from the country by Dave Holloway, who was a CIA pilot, had uh, worked for a, a CIA proprietary cutout airline, and had a relationship with the agency. And this guy Holloway travels with uh, Strassmeyer to a safe house in Texas before going to Mexico. Now, at that safe house in Texas. Uh, Holloway arranges for Strassmeyer to get a friendly media interview. And the person that he arranges the interview with is a gentleman by the name of Rick Shero, who reported for uh, Soldier of Fortune magazine and who also had connections to the CIA. He worked for them when he was in Africa. I think it was Angola, but in one of those uh, places over in Africa, the agency was doing so much stuff in, in the 80s. So you got this guy, Strassmeyer. The last person he sees when he leaves the country is CIA. The very first interview that he gives to a friendly media outlet is CIA. The first person he talks to when he comes to the United States, a gentleman by the name of uh, Vincent Petrusky, was also CIA. And so is it just a coincidence that all these intelligence figures uh, appear here? I think that it would be reasonable to say that that's not a coincidence, that that's a pattern. You know, the Strassmeyer story, again, reminds me of 9-11 in another way. If if you remember, you know, so Strassmeyer gets thrown out by, flown out, not thrown out, gets flown out by Holloway. And the Americans work closely on this project with the German intelligence GSG-9. Now, if you remember the 9-11 story, there were... Uh, there was a chunk, there was a good chunk of the of the backstory of the supposed hijackers that took place in Hamburg, Germany. So you keep seeing these through lines through the stories, even though they are starting to be decades apart. We're starting to, as you said, we're starting to see patterns. There is definitely a close cooperation between uh, Germany and the United States when it comes to uh, intelligence, especially in recent years. And in fact, um, what you see is that uh, at the time in the 90s, the Germans were very interested in a, um, it was like a, a, there was a network for smuggling neo-Nazi propaganda into Germany, which is it's illegal under German law. And what was happening is this material was being uh, smuggled into Germany by a group called White Aryan Resistance, headed by a Tom Metzger and a Dennis Mahon. And so there was a cooperative investigation between German authorities and uh, the FBI and the Department of Justice to locate and stop the source of this propaganda. And they did eventually do that. Now, that operation was called Atlantic 2, Atlantic 2. 
And one thing that Roger Charles, when investigating this, asked and speculated was, well, if there's an Atlantic II, then there was an Atlantic I. And we uh, wondered uh, whether or not the Andy Strassmeyer operation might have been Atlantic I or may have been in some way uh, one of those operations that was being carried out um, mutually between the DOJ and the German authorities. Do you hold any thread of belief at all that uh, that John Doe number two could have been Strassmeyer or Jose Padilla or Hussein al Husseini? Yeah, I do have some beliefs there. Now, I'm just stressed that these are my opinion. When I first was uh, really uh, digging into some of the alternative accounts of this story was in 1996 and 97. I was um, uh, subscribed to a mailing list called the John Doe Times. Uh, which was an internet mailing list, and it republished a lot of stories by uh, J.D. Cash. And back at that time, I was convinced that John Doe II was Andy Strassmeyer. Now, I personally, I no longer believe that to be the case for a number of reasons, although I do believe he was involved uh, in the bombing and in the planning of it. I think he was a key component of it. I don't think he's the person ID'd, though, as John Doe number two, primarily because it comes down to the physical characteristics. Most of these witnesses describe John Doe two as being about five foot eight to five foot ten, and uh, having a very powerful upper body, very muscular, um, and some cases having a, either a tan or being described as a dark complected or olive complected, and that just these things do not match uh, Andy's description. Um, and then in terms of the others, uh, for Jose Padilla, the only thing I've seen is that people have uh, put his, his picture from the uh, 2000s next to the John Doe 2 picture and noted some similarities. Now, I don't know, though, of any evidentiary connections uh, between uh, Padilla and John Doe 2. And in terms of Hussani al Hussani, this is an Iraqi, uh, former, uh, formerly lived in Iraq, came over to live in the United States after the Gulf War. And he was accused of being John Doe 2 by a local uh, news station in uh, Oklahoma. There's subsequently been a book written about that, which I've said before on other broadcasts and other uh, platforms that I do not believe that he is John Doe 2 and think that uh, that story is really kind of a smokescreen and that there's not a whole lot there. So in my mind, John Doe 2 is still, to this day, as much of a mystery now as he was in the 1990s. Do you think the most likely answer for the identity of John Doe number two is if we knew his name, we wouldn't recognize it? That could be the case. Um, I know I've also had someone suggest to me recently that a gentleman named uh, Ali Mohammed uh, may have been John Doe two, And he does fit some of the physical description. He did have a military bearing. He did uh, fit the same general physical description, and th th those not aware, uh, Peter Lance has written some very good books about Ali Muhammad, and he he his name has come up as a suspect among some, but I've not been able to find uh, strong uh, links that would say that he was here at this time when McVeigh was, but I certainly consider him as a, a candidate, you know, for what it's worth, yeah. Yes, for anybody out there, uh, for anyone out there who has not ever read a Peter Lance book on 9-11, you should. Now, Lance comes from a mainstream perspective. He's not a conspiracy guy. But his background, the investigation that he does, is maybe the deepest I've seen. Uh, just marvelous work. So let's turn to the White House, because as Harry Truman said, the buck stops here. The FBI, as we know, is part of the Justice Department and or it's at least part of the executive branch and the head of the justice department is the attorney general janet reno now in 1993 janet reno does not come out of waco looking good at all and so here we have oklahoma two years later what responsibility for the investigation can we put on the white house and on janet reno that's a great question and what i think there is that the department of justice uh, essentially probably had some of the same motivations that the FBI had. And when I say that, I mean their, some of their motives would be limiting risk. You know, they want to make sure the case against McVeigh is successful 
to do that. They want to narrow the conspiracy down. They want to uh, suppress any additional conspirators or any evidence of additional conspirators. So th- this is a pragmatic uh, motivation on their part. They want to, to be successful, of course, in their prosecution. But also, uh, if there was any sort of law, law enforcement investigation or undercover operation or something like that going on, they want at all costs for that to not be revealed. So I believe the Justice Department uh, basically wanted to ensure that this was sort of a black and white case, and it was McVeigh and Nichols and no one else. And I believe that the reason uh, they they had that position is because ultimately, if there was some sort of operation where you've got Germany and the United States cooperating on this intelligence investigation, and this asset of theirs, Andy Strassmeyer, was responsible for inciting um, inciting this bombing, which then the documents you can see he was advocating bombings of federal buildings, and that, that he went just way too far as a law enforcement asset. So uh, their goal essentially was to cover things up and to keep an official story in place that is simple and that causes people to think that they did a great job and everybody responsible was brought to justice. It's interesting, these FBI infiltrations of these uh, supposedly far right wing uh, domestic groups, you know, the FBI paints these people, you know, the government paints these people as backwoods, gun owning, gun toting, hillbilly types that only wear camouflage, uh, longer beards, uh, Devout churchgoers, those crazy evangelicals, they say. And um, it's an odd thing when they end up outsmarting the FBI and outmaneuvering the FBI, or the FBI ends up falling over its own feet in these operations, like, as you, as you mentioned earlier, the, the Gretchen Whitmer case. Uh, it, this can't do any good for the FBI. Mm. Well... You know, anybody who repeats uncritically the FBI's official story, you know, that certainly is going to help them accomplish what they want to accomplish. And they want essentially attention uh, on this case. They they don't want any additional attention there. And they characterize it largely as uh, something that was very successful. You know, when Merrick Garland was nominated for uh, attorney general, he, uh, you know, is touted as as having done an excellent job on the Oklahoma city bombing. And so, yeah, that, that is kind of the way, um, I guess you could say it plays out when it comes to their propaganda in this case. But, um, anybody who looks at the material facts of this case and digs deep, even just read the preliminary hearing from April 27th, and you will see FBI under oath talking about the fact that McVeigh had another, another, uh, suspect with him. And so this propaganda does not stand up to any level of scrutiny. And then with respect to incompetence or, you know, what uh, what can account for the FBI's behavior here, I think you're dealing with a couple of things. You have, I think, there's some level of, of incompetence. Also, also, though, you have immense arrogance. Uh, they, they think that everything they do is going to be perfect and that they can do whatever they want. And with, with that comes a lot of liabilities. They have blind spots that they don't know about. And it's certainly possible, I think, that they may have um, they may have been outsmarted by their very targets in this case. Um, and another equally uh, interesting, um, I guess you could say, theory on this is that um, it's believed that these intelligence connections that we were talking about earlier um, are responsible for penetrating an existing FBI undercover operation and ensuring that it is successful for their own ends, which in a way would guarantee that the FBI would cover it up in order for them to cover up their own uh, sting operation that failed. They would, uh, uh, they would play ball in order to, to keep themselves, uh, that is to keep their own image intact. And so that's one thing we're doing now in investigating these intelligence connections is this theory that this undercover operation was penetrated and it was made to be successful, and this guaranteed FBI cooperation in the investigation. 
Do you have any suspicion that Timothy McVeigh might have acted on behalf of intelligence? Well, that's a question that I think is explored pretty pretty well in uh, Wendy Painting's book, Aberration in the Heartland of the Real. She talks about uh, several different possible scenarios, um, a lone wolf attack with McVeigh as the lone wolf um, versus acting in a group with others versus him acting as some sort of undercover agent in some ways. And a lot of that um, comes back to something that uh, McVeigh himself told his first attorneys, his first attorneys, which were uh, Susan Otto and John Coyle. And these attorneys said that um, one of the first things McVeigh said to them is that when he got out of the army and he went into the National Guard, that he was recruited for some type of undercover clandestine operation to infiltrate and incite uh, militias and white supremacist groups. And that he said that when he did the bombing, he was acting in his capacity as an informant or asset in that operation. And of course, McVeigh, though, being an unreliable narrator, we don't know how much of that we can believe, you know, if any, but it certainly has presented an interesting theory and it is one uh, that, that Wendy accurately explores in her book. I do urge people to get that book and read it. It is um, an ex- one of the few excellent books on this case. And I want to make it clear for everyone out there in case someone believes I misspoke. I wasn't asking necessarily if intelligence through McVeigh was responsible for the Oklahoma City bombing. I was asking if McVeigh had ever worked for intelligence, uh, especially before the bombing. So... If there's anyone out there who wants to follow your work or follow you online, how can they do that? Yeah, so uh, to find me online, I'm on Twitter. You can find me at it's uh, Booth, which is B-O-O-T-H underscore O-K-C. That's Booth underscore O-K-C. And you may find my uh, research archive, which is news clippings, FBI documents, all kinds of stuff at libertarianinstitute.org slash O-K-C. You know, I also plan to uh, take my archive and provide the, all that material to um, Our Hidden History, who has a wonderful archive of material, and I'm going to provide that to him so we can have kind of a mirror for it. Um, so that, that's where folks can reach me online. Richard Booth, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. Thank you for writing for Garrison. We all know that you'll continue to do that. There's so much more of the story to tell. But really, just thank you so much for your time and for the work that you continue to do. Well, thanks so much, ST. I really appreciate it. And uh, I love writing about this case and and, uh, working with Garrison. So I do think I've got some uh, other things in store for our readers. I'm ST Patrick. This is the Midnight Rider News Show from the other side of the mountain on the best side of midnight. I wish you peace. Man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist You only choose sides based upon the rhetoric The truth is the various, the slow flow of evidence And lies on both sides, got to admire their cleverness But the code of personality is venomous The power keeps ascending, agendas are so treacherous They ten steps ahead of us, cementing their survival And y'all just applaud and fall for these false idols Who slither through the snake pits, dark shadows and shape shift Devalue the paper, less power for you to play with State agents operating so flagrant for us peasants and vagrants Provided they monster Federal mobsters Socioeconomic warfare tactics Divide and conquer Stop and ponder for a minute How they prosper Insert them in disguise And you don't realize what they sponsor They rotate the scapegoats Stockpiles of banknotes Control everything from lab coats To fake votes Smile in your face when they strip you of your freedom Continuously telling you lies Why you believe them Government condition and dumped down education The school to prison pipeline Fuel and incarceration Speak in pursuit of the truth and be met with violence Because one way or another they want to obtain your silence Common sense questions they never want you to ask never. Like how much can they take with some beer and a mask Come And the ultimate hypocrisy is that they're spreading freedom and democracy By supporting corrupt corporate monopolies Mainstream media ain't telling the truth either But you entertained by their high stakes kabuki theater Hit us against each other, watch us burn it down to ashes Just another way to gain influence over the masses Military weapons on civilians